Good evening. You're watching The Big Story with Haryanto Diman. I'm Olivia Kuei. Singapore reported 897 new COVID-19 cases as of noon today. 13 are Singaporeans and permanent residents. Migrant workers living in dormitories continue to be the most severely affected group, making up the majority of the remaining cases. The total count of confirmed cases here is now at 12,075. Despite frequent calls for the public to stay at home and to act sensibly, some are still not taking safe distancing seriously. I spoke to Environment and Water Resources Minister Masago Zokifli earlier today, and he said these people fall into three categories, those who don't know, those who don't care, and those who remain defiant. Here's more from that interview. Give yes. a daily update on the number of people who were fined for breaching circuit breaker rules as well as those caught without a mask while out. What do you make of the numbers? Are you surprised, disappointed even, that there are still people not abiding by safe distancing and other measures? Well, I'll say that uh, most people are staying home, mm -hmm. but um, those who have been issuing fines for violating safety distancing measures, they, are, they fall into three categories. They are the don't know, don't care, or the defiance. And uh, unfortunately, the, the number who are defiant, uh, for them, we have to even call the police to ensure that the safety of our enforcement officers are not uh, threatened. Right. Minister, if the number of those who are still flouting the rules doesn't come down, do you believe the $300 fine for first offences should be increased? Well, I don't want to get there. I think most mm. importantly, we keep exhorting uh, our uh, society to basically stay home. And by and large, when we have uh, reduced the number of essential services, as well as uh, closing the uh, car parks to our uh, national parks, uh, these uh, measures have uh, helped to bring down the numbers of people going out and therefore consequently the number of people who will be violating uh, the measures. Right. Well, several of those uh, violating the measures are the elderly. Why do you think this particular group is having difficulty adapting to the circuit breaker? Well, I can understand that many of these elderly may feel cooped up at home. Uh, most of most of this all the time before these uh, COVID-19 measures took place, they've been been free to go out uh, anywhere around the neighborhood, meet friends, even sit alone in the in the park. But today uh, and and uh, for the days that uh, until first of June, we are telling everybody to stay home. And uh, I think loneliness is a, a little bit difficult to cope. But it is there are things that they can do, and uh, we are also outreaching to this group with uh, MSF. Uh, to uh, understand what is uh, uh, bugging them at home and what we can do to basically help them stay at home. Right. So from the elderly, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. It was reported on Wednesday that six youths were fined for breaking safe distancing measures. Do you believe they are the, ex uh, the exception rather than the norm? How have younger people adapted to it actually? Well, whether you're old or young, you should be staying home. And I think if you try to try to go out to basically break the curfew, uh, you think it is fun, well, inevitably, it may come to uh, you being infected by the diseases or passing on to your friends. I think this is something you don't want to do. We have to get our youth to realize uh, their, their uh, irrational, uh, acts of defiance or act of uh, trying to push the uh, the uh, pressure to meet each other it will also inevitably cause uh, the disease to be uh, uh, spread among themselves and then to mm -hmm. their loved ones and the consequence will be unbearable. Right. Well, safe distancing enforcement officers have been deployed for several weeks now. Do you think these EOs and ambassadors could actually be weak links as well? What precautions do they take in terms of protection and distancing? Well, we, we brief our EOs daily to make sure mm -hmm. that if there are lapses uh, or sometimes misunderstanding of what they need to do or how they should be going about their work, uh, they get briefed properly. Uh, we, we are also happy that uh, uh, the public do feedback to us when these lapses happen. You know, we are human. Um, and this, has not, this is not the kind of job they do uh, as part of their job description. 
and uh, they are deployed, being deployed on uh, on the ground uh, and learning as as the uh, situation evolves. But in any case, I think they are doing a good job and their presence uh, well understood and well accepted by the society, and many of them are being treated with respect. Mm. Well. The police said they've seen a rise in the number of abuse cases to some 3,000 of these uh, EOs and ambassadors. Why do you think these officers and ambassadors are met with such abuse? Well, I think in our society, like I mentioned, the third bucket, the people who uh, are defiant will always be in society. And for this group of people, we warn them that uh, we will bear on them the full extent of law if mm -hmm. they become violent to our EOs. Uh, but more importantly, the rest of the uh, people who are violated are, are, are those who sometimes don't know what are the new measures are being put today or the next day. And then there are people also who don't care. But when, when you approach them, uh, they, they, they comply. Right. Well, when it comes to these matters, uh, Muir uh, takes a zero-tolerance approach. There are a number of penalties for causing hurt to EOs and ambassadors, including a jail term of up to seven years, a fine and a caning. Minister, should punishments be made more severe if instances of abuse keep occurring? Well, we have been uh, asking the uh, justice system to ensure that uh, the punishment being meted out are uh, 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 done in a balanced way, whether it's to, to ensure that deterrence, to ensure that the people who are being abused are also feeling that justice has been meted out. So we leave it to the justice system to do that. But at the end of the day, it's all up to us to keep our tempers down. Everyone is going through this problem together. And I know that staying at home, being cooped up, is a very difficult uh, situation to, to uh, cope with. But uh, let's uh, just uh, hunker down together. This is something we do together. Nobody is special. Nobody has special treatment. So if we just uh, tolerate this, we hope that uh, this will go away uh, as soon as we can uh, see the improvements take place. Mm. Right, let's hope for that as well. So, yes. the weight of your ministry's responsibilities is growing from crowding in parks, so keeping an eye out for a safe distancing deviance. And uh, the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources may have more in its periphery in the near future with the evolving rules under the circuit breaker. So, Minister, how are you coping with the heavier, thicker portfolio? Well, we are a good team. Everyone knows uh, and uh, what they're supposed to, to do and the purpose of their work. Everyone understands that uh, by putting in uh, their, their part, we can uh, ensure that the circuit breaker measures are being observed by everybody and that those very few who are on the road uh, know that uh, we will deal with them and that uh, they should not be defying the law. Hmm. Well, some people say the extension of the circuit breaker is not just about community spread numbers, but also about breaking people's bad habits and forming new ones for the long term. What do you think? How true is that? Well, firstly, we, we extended and also increased, tightened the uh, safe distancing measures, basically to bring down the number of interactions in society even further. We have seen the numbers of infection in society stabilizing, but that's not good enough because there is always this cluster moving around invisibly. We don't know where they are, who they are. Therefore, the best way to do this is to ensure even more people stay home. And that's what we are trying to achieve. So we hope that, uh, like we see in many other countries, when the numbers go down to single digit or even zero, we can slowly lift the restrictions and then go back to normal. I think this is the, the message we are giving, giving to people. We are not there to... Uh, uh, curb people's freedom, we are there to ensure that all of us come out of this alive and healthy. Right. Well, Minister Masagos, it's been slightly more than two months since the SG Clean campaign was launched. The SG Clean Task Force was announced on March the 6th. What inroads have both the campaign and task force made since then in raising hygiene standards across Singapore? What examples can you give us? Well, I, I'm, I'm happy that uh, many people now understand the need for better hygiene. Not only because good hygiene is good for us, but uh, we have to always be ready for new, different kind of crises in uh, decades ahead. So I'm glad that uh, in, the, in the road to 
putting better hygiene standards. I've got uh, very good feedback, even uh, embr uh, stakeholders embracing these measures. One of the things we will see now very visibly is that uh, all our uh, stallholders, FMB operators are putting on masks. And that's uh, going forward, this is something we want to make permanent. Uh, and we want to uh, ensure that this will be uh, complied to uh, very rigorously. And even now, we have been asking everybody to make sure they put their masks on when they're handling food. And if they don't, we will uh, find them. Right. So you touched on this earlier, I guess, um, making certain measures uh, more permanent, like you know, hawkers and people in the F&B industry wearing masks. So when it comes to ingrading the importance of personal and uh, public hygiene practices, do you think this mindset will last even after uh, the COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, well, we, we, we know we have to do what we can do in terms of enforcement is at the cleaning companies. We have uh, imposed standards, higher standards and, and frequency of cleaning on these companies. And we will maintain this beyond the COVID period. But like you, like you mentioned, the real, uh, the, what, who really matters are ourselves, uh, whether we can change our habit mm. in using these public uh, places like toilets and uh, hawker centers and so forth. I'm happy that the schools have made great inroads, uh, made, made great improvements to inculcate good habits for, to their children. Uh, but um, I'm hopeful that uh, most of us understand the need for better hygiene and, and improve our uh, own habits in uh, using uh, public facilities like uh, hawker centers and toilets. In other news, the Health Ministry has suspended one of its offices after she allegedly leaked the number of new COVID-19 cases in Singapore and retrieved her patient's records without authorization. MOH added that it is now reviewing its processes to ensure that the necessary information security protocols are in place. Meanwhile, the Singapore Tourism Board has set aside $22 million to help tourism businesses market their services and build demand when global travel resumes. Travel agents will also be allowed to use their reserves to make ends meet. The minimum financial requirement that agents must fulfil to keep their licence has been reduced by 90% until the end of the year. A total of 85 Singapore residents returned this morning from Saudi Arabia as the country suspends all commercial flight services. The Foreign Affairs Ministry said that returnees will serve 14 days of self-isolation at dedicated stay-home notice facilities. And a large COVID-19 facility being set up at Tanjung Paga Terminal now could house up to 15,000 patients or foreign workers. It's part of a broader plan to ensure adequate space to meet future demand. Existing community facilities meant to house recovering patients and those with milder symptoms include Singapore Expo D Resort in TUC in Pasiris and Changi Exhibition Centre. Foreign workers in dormitories are still making up the bulk of the new cases. And their welfare continues to be of concern to all of us. We're joined by Mr. Bennett Menon, Executive Director of Advocacy Group Migrant Workers Centre. Now, Bennett, despite some complaints, the bigger dorms seem to have made to have many safe distancing measures in place. Uh, what about factory converted dorms though, as well as those living at construction sites and other areas? These smaller, more isolated groups, are they slipping through the cracks? What are the concerns for the various groups and what is being done? Okay, uh, so the challenge for these smaller uh, dormitory operations and facilities uh, is that uh, some can be very small, there's a wide range. Uh, they can house anywhere from 10 people to uh, over 900 people. Um, and the other challenge is that there are about a thousand, more than 1,100 of these facilities and they're scattered all over the island. Um, so the logistical exercise in trying to manage uh, COVID-19 really uh, challenges uh, is just excessively magnified uh, by the fact that they're so scattered. Uh, having said that, uh, I think the Migrant Work Centre um, discussion with, of course, the government authorities and uh, in partnership with many other ground-up uh, outfits and NGOs, um, we've decided to focus our attention on the smaller uh, dormitory facilities. These are uh, 1,100 odd uh, uh, housing facilities. Um, 
Uh, so, uh, I think managing uh, COVID-19 with challenges, I, uh, the priority for everyone concerned is to ensure that uh, the basic, most urgent immediate needs of the workers um, first address, uh, and then only then uh, we can start to direct attention towards um, safe distancing, um, watching your health, uh, washing your hands, um, uh, going to see a doctor, uh, uh, escalating it to uh, mm -hmm. medical professionals uh, as soon as possible if you play any of the symptoms, uh, challenges like both. So, uh, addressing the basic essential needs, uh, urgent needs, um, mm -hmm. I think what we've done is among all the organizations, we've kind of fanned ourselves out. Uh, each organization taking charge of a particular area. In that respect, uh, the Migrant Work Centre, we've uh, taken on. Uh, the vision of essential items, items like the uh, laundry detergent, uh, bath soap, um, hand sanitizers, uh, toothbrush kit, um, shaving kit. But these are all essential items that, um, you know, without getting them addressed, um, it would be very difficult for the migrant workers and not being able to uh, keep themselves clean, uh, showers, uh, do those things. Very difficult for them to start concentrating on. Uh, other things like safe distance, uh, watching their health, washing their hands, and things like that. We have a partner organization, uh, the Alliance of Guest Workers Outreach, uh, that are working with us to handle all the emergency uh, catering needs uh, of migrant workers uh, in instances where maybe their employers or their dormitory operators have not uh, made arrangements for, for their catering and their food. Um, we've also partnered with other organizations, other NGOs also, to go in and give like uh, emotional, uh, uh, psychological counselling, um, and other the basic needs. And the hope is that uh, in helping the dormitory operators would tend to be of a smaller scale as compared to the bigger dormitories. Uh, help them uh, deal and address such issues um, up until they will be able to then uh, help workers that stay in their dormitories to implementing uh, measures on safe distancing and, and uh, uh, all those things I mentioned earlier. Right. Mm. Well, Bernard, as of yesterday, uh, 25 dorms were gazetted as isolation areas. Now, we spoke to another advocacy group, TWC2, last week on what more could be done. They suggested reducing the density of workers in each room, but building alternative accommodation and various related logistics also take time. So what do you think can be done in the meantime, especially more immediate measures yeah so i think you hit the nail on the head um what needs to be done now uh what is most urgent now and that is what uh, most of us are directing our attention uh so like i said um on the essential items on the food and catering uh the boys in the migrant workers in the dormitories the larger dorms uh, especially the gazetted dorms uh i think it's a uh, common knowledge that uh, uh multi Agency government task force uh, is looking after the needs in those in the dorm. Um, uh, uh, a coalition, a partnership of NGOs and conduct initiatives uh, playing their part also uh, to help address some of these same issues uh, in the smaller type of facilities. Um, but I think the important thing is, um, uh, you know, we, we came out of, of SARS. Uh, and uh, very soon after uh, Foreign Employees Dormitories Act was uh, enacted. Um, and the standards for housing for migrant worker brothers have uh, continued to be uh, evolved over time, uh, improved over time. Um, so this includes spatial requirements for each worker, sanitary facilities, cleaning facilities, bar facilities, recreational facilities. All these things, if you track changes in the laws uh, through time, uh, especially over the last maybe five, seven years, uh, improvements have been made to six standards, so they've continued to be placed uh, over time. Mm -hmm. um, many of these changes actually came into play because we remembered SARS. Um, and uh, I think one of the things many people don't really know of is the fact uh, COVID-19 is really very unprecedented in the way it operates, uh, in the way it's very, very easily, very, very quickly. 
and um, perhaps the way our dormitories were shaped uh, did not factor a uh, uh, fast spreading uh, virus like that. It's not to say that they did not have its fair share of uh, endemic uh, response measures uh, as requirements based on dormitory operators. Um, but I'm sure, as like in the case of SARS, when we come out of this, uh, and I'm sure we will, uh, if we stay together, united. Um, when we come out of this, I'm sure there will be lessons and there will be more changes and improvements made. Uh, I think most importantly, um, we need to focus on what's most urgent now, uh, on mm. taking care of the migrant workers in the dormitories, uh, regardless of what dormitory type they live in, uh, and helping them as much as we can and making sure that uh, look after them and stay together with us as a community we all make uh, through the 19th year. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Now, Bernard, the Straits Times visited three dorms uh, this week, including Singapore's largest active cluster, S11 dormitory at Pungol. The journalists spoke to some of the workers. Have you had a word with them as well? How are they coping in this difficult time? Yeah, so, uh, myself and a, a team of my, my colleagues, uh, we were actually at, at S11 uh, for three days uh, after it was gazetted. Uh, one of the key reasons why we were there even before the gazette, uh, because uh, the migrant worker center, we have a grassroots network of uh, migrant workers themselves, whom we call MWC ambassadors. Uh, you may have heard uh, of these ambassadors in news reports over the last two weeks. Um, in all, they number about 5,000. They're all migrant workers themselves, mostly more experienced migrant workers that have been here maybe six to eight years and above. Mm. And uh, the bulk of them stay in the dormitories um, and what we did was we, we, we did a lot of engagement with them uh, when COVID-19 began uh, and in the lead up to uh, you know what has happened in the dormitories we actually pre-engaged all of them uh, and the purpose of doing that was to help them help us disseminate information on safe distancing, personal hygiene, things like that, the migrant workers. Um, they are key ambassadors and advocates for us on the ground. They help disseminate messages for us uh, very often. Um, in the lead up to the gazetting of the dorms, we also beat them that uh, there's a possibility this might happen. And if it were to happen and they were isolated uh, in any way, then they would have a very big responsibility to help take care of their brothers uh, within the dorm. Uh, we continue to remain in contact with them even after the past teams have. Uh, in and uh, in fact, I think they are key feedback channel uh, for the multi agency task force, uh, trying to stabilize the situation on the ground, uh, handle the issues that may come uh, from time to time regarding food, regarding essentials, uh, regarding mobile connectivity, uh, all the basic items that would uh, need to be addressed before you can start uh, uh, directing your mind for the migrant workers. Uh, attention towards uh, themselves from uh, COVID-19. So as we understand it, uh, these issues have gradually stabilized uh, in the last two weeks. Um, mm. uh, Multi-agency task force have, has been uh, taking our feedback uh, generated from the ambassadors on the ground uh, and addressing this situation systematically. Uh, a situation where today I think um, most of the the norms, the situation has largely stabilized. There are still issues that pop up from time to time, but we continue to provide feedback uh, with the intention uh, and, and the, the hope this will be addressed quickly uh, so that we can start uh, 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 getting everyone concentrated on this COVID-19. Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Bernard, for your time and for the work your organization does. Uh, we've been speaking to Bernard Menon, Executive Director of Migrant Workers Centre. Okay, guys.
Looking overseas, across the causeway, Malaysia extended its movement control order once more by another two weeks until May 12th. The order, which began on March 18th, has been extended twice before. It was initially scheduled to end next Tuesday, April the 28th. Although Malaysia has seen a decrease in infections, Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin said that steps have to be taken until the pandemic is completely under control. He did not discount the possibility of a further extension. Similarly, the Philippines extended Manila's lockdown until May 15th. The capital city accounts for more than two-thirds of the country's nearly 7,000 cases. President Rodrigo Duterte also offered a reward of 50 million pesos or 986,000 US dollars to any Filipino who creates a vaccine. And Indonesia announced a temporary ban on both domestic and international air and sea travel to prevent a further spread of the virus. The ban begins today and will see air travel suspended until June 1st and sea travel until June the 8th. Exceptions to the ban include cargo as well as flights to repatriate Indonesian and foreign citizens. Over in the U.S., this week has seen the reopen protests hit a new level of intensity, fueled by the apparent belief that COVID-19 is no worse than the flu and that the measures are unnecessary. Ironically, the state of Kentucky saw its highest spike in cases after a weekend of such reopen protests. So let's bring in U.S. Bureau Chief for The Straits Times, Namal Ghosh, to discuss this. Namal, there are currently close to 890,000 cases in the U.S. Total deaths have crossed 50,000, and that is with social distancing measures. Now, some are suggesting that states reopening could be truly disastrous for the U.S. What's your take? Right, so here is the most likely scenario going forward past, say, May 1. We will have a situation where the virus is still raging and a lot of the country is still under some form of stay at home orders or there are uh, you know restrictions on public gatherings a lot of work from home will continue we will have regional hotspots, but the rest of the country gets back to a sort of new normal in which there is still mandated social distancing for instance new york city has cancelled major events through june there will still be some fear of crowded spaces because the virus will still be around Right now, while we have seen some governors and mayors wanting to get back to normal and we've seen some protests against uh, restrictions, these are small protests. Polls show that the majority of Americans are worried about opening too fast. So things will get better in the summer as testing and contact tracing reaches a critical level and we know what is going on with this virus. But there's a possibility of a new wave in October or November. Mm. While the damage may already have been done to local economies, there are genuine concerns over the ability of small businesses to survive. Now, a $484 billion coronavirus aid deal is expected to help boost small business loan programs. But is it coming in time? Good question. At best, it may be just in time for many, but it is a fact that a lot of small businesses will not survive. If you own a restaurant, for example, even if you open, again, there may be seating restrictions. Revenue streams won't reappear overnight. Your whole business model may be gone. Likewise, small businesses dependent, say, on the service industry or on components from a supply chain that may be disrupted. Now, there are serious questions as well over who got the assistance the, uh, the, assistance the first time around. It was big business that got a lot. And banks apparently prioritized applications of their wealthiest clients before turning to other loan seekers. But there has been some blowback. At least three national restaurant chains have given back their assistance. So administering this, implementing it equitably and to the benefit of those for whom it is intended will continue to be a challenge as well. Well, Namal, both President Donald Trump and former VP Joe Biden appear to be playing the blame game using China. Is taunting China a sh short-sighted move for the man expected to lead the U.S. out of a post-COVID-19 slump in 2021? Yes, well, President Trump is playing to his base and Joe Biden is trying to out-Trump him in a sense, laying, uh, playing to the center-right of uh, American politics. So blaming China is now quite bipartisan. Perceptions of China had turned negative even before this. 
and there is a very real phenomenon not widespread you don't see it all over but there have been many more instances than usual of racism tinged bullying or abuse of Chinese Americans or people who may just look like ethnic Chinese. Now in terms of geopolitics the bottom line is the perception of China as a problem and a threat is going to persist. It is now part of the mindset in DC, it's part of the strate uh, strategic establishment and this crisis will spur more efforts to dealing crucial supply chains from China. But there are limits to that because American companies also want the China market. Uh, so taunting and insults is obviously not the most constructive way to manage this relationship because it stokes ultra-nationalist responses on either side. But political considerations in both countries mean it is going to be the norm for at least this year as the political campaign here at least gets back on track. And while that domestic aspect is understood, certainly it risks getting out of hand to a degree. Well, thank you so much, Namal. That was thank our you. U.S. Bureau Chief Namal Ghosh joining us from Washington, D.C. An estimated 1.8 billion Muslims around the world began observing Ramadan today, a somber affair this year for many amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Unprecedented bans on mass prayers and family gatherings have put a damper on spirits in nearby Indonesia and Malaysia where national religious organizations have called on the faithful to stay, at, to stay home. Similarly, Saudi Arabia announced that the two holy mosques in Mecca and Medina will remain closed throughout Ramadan. But some territories have waved off fears. Several thousand worshippers attended evening prayers yesterday at the biggest mosque in Indonesia's Banda Aceh, although crowds were smaller than usual. In Pakistan, while most clerics have complied with the shutdown, several prominent imams have rallied their devotees to ignore the safe distancing measures. Dozens had signed a letter demanding the Pakistan government exempt mosques from the shutdown during the holy month or invite the anger of God and the faithful. On Saturday, the government gave in, allowing mosques to stay open for Ramadan as long as they followed 20 rules. These include forcing congregants to maintain a six-foot distance, bring their own prayer mats and do their ablutions at home. And how will Singapore's Muslim community observe Ramadan during the circuit breaker period? Earlier today, I posed this question to Minister in Charge of Muslim Affairs, Mazakos Zukifli. The circuit breaker has been extended until June the 1st. It affects the entire Ramadan period, which begins today, as well as Hari Raya festivities on May 24th. What was the community's reaction to the measures, especially the unprecedented step to close mosques? I'm very happy that uh, our religious uh, sector, the religious scholars, have uh, are always aligned and understand the need to uh, issue instructions and guidance based on medically sound advice and uh, very much earlier on even before other countries uh, in, uh, effected the closure of mosques uh, scholars in singapore to agreed unanimously to do so ahead of everybody else and mm. uh, for the ramadan and also for the uh, coming up hari raya the same guidance have been given uh, by the same group of uh, scholars very respected in the society and that's uh, calling our community basically to adapt and to also do our part to contribute towards the safe distancing that we have to implement uh, for the safety of everybody else. Has the spirit or the mood of Hari Raya also changed with the cancellation of the iconic Geylang Sarai Bazaar this year? Of course, of course. These are the things we all in yes. Singapore look forward to. You know, yes. I think when I go to Geylang Bazaar, it's not just uh, Muslims and young, but uh, everybody, old and young, and uh, even our non-Muslim friends. Exactly, uh, I have been yeah, there myself. Enjoy it. Yes, and you get the guest, the best kind of food, and different kind of food during this time. Uh, so we have to adapt, and uh, some of these uh, bazaar owners have now put their goods on uh, e-platform, and uh, they they are if they are uh, if they are not constrained in the delivery of these uh, goods. Um, we can certainly still participate in some form of uh, bazaar shopping, mm -hmm. but in a different kind of bazaar. Right. So, how do you feel about your own Hari Raya plans being disrupted, Minister? Well, the most important thing is that I have to make sure my mom understands that uh, I shouldn't be visiting her and that uh, we will do our uh, usual uh, greetings uh, via video 
uh, she's getting used to it. Uh, but uh, you know, old people, uh, they have very, uh, ha they have very strong habits. That's hard to change. But I'm, I'm glad uh, she, she understands. The same mm -hmm. thing goes for everybody. So I hope we, kn we know that everybody's adjusting. Everybody needs to accept this new norm. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, and I hope that this is the only time we ever have to do this. Yeah, here's hoping. Well, churches in Singapore are streaming their masses and services online. How have mosques and other Malay Muslim organisa uh, organisations reached out to the community to offer assistance during this uh, difficult period? Indeed, uh, our, uh, the MUIS uh, Muslim uh, Religious Council has uh, put together a number of uh, online uh, packages to help the community cope with the, uh, uh, the, the uh, changes that we have to make in our life. For example, online donations, uh, online lessons, uh, even uh, getting food delivered to the, uh, those recipients of uh, zakat, which are the needy. So all these kind of things uh, are being, have been put together, uh, not only by MUIS, but also by uh, many stakeholders in our community, including the uh, uh, Malay Chambers, uh, the uh, uh, various Malay Muslim organizations, all coming together in the spirit of Kotong Royong to help mm. us cope with this period. Right, Minister, before we wrap up this uh, conversation. Do you have a message for those in the Malay, Malay Muslim community here as they observe the fasting month? Well, my, my message to, to everybody uh, observing the Ramadan is simply this. We should be really be uh, thankful that our country, by and large, have got through this uh, period of crisis uh, well, and we will together get out of this. During the Ramadan, the most important thing is to observe uh, fasting as well as to give alms to the poor. This is the fundamental uh, acts of uh, worship in Ramadan. Beyond that, we have to adapt and adjust to the new norm and uh, take the opportunity to pray with our families at home and build good relationships going forward. And you can watch the full interview with Minister Masagos on our YouTube channel. Before we go though, Jan, I understand you of course have yeah. been working from home for the entire week. How has that been for you? I think the experience is quite nice actually and I'm quite glad that I get to spend the first day of Ramadan uh, at home. So I'm just ah, waiting for, yeah, I'm waiting for breakfast time, uh, which is in about 30 minutes or so. Yep, it's coming up shortly. Yeah. Yeah, but next week we're going to do a switch. Mm -hmm. So it's you back at home. That's right. Can't wait. <laughs> I'm sure you're looking forward to, look, looking forward to that as well. Aye. Now there we have it. Our top stories uh, for today. For more news and videos, do log on to straightstimes.com. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kuei. We'll see you on Monday. In the meantime, have a good weekend.